Hey everybody, this is your host Jeremy. I want to take a quick second at the beginning of the episode here just to let you know that we have launched a Patreon to support the show. Check us out at patreon.com slash giving the mic. Your contribution helps us cover hosting costs, edit costs, and even some equipment upgrades. Patreon is a way that you can automatically support the show each month with a donation as little as a dollar. Five dollars every month gives you access to regular premium episodes as well as the backer only special cat photo email list. You can actually see the cats of the host that you can hear in the background. Once again, that is at patreon.com slash giving the mic. I thank you, or my co hosts thank you, and the cats thank you. Hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm a dork living in Portland, Oregon, who spent too many years listening to podcasts and not doing anything creative. This is my attempt to rectify that, to create and contribute something where I talk to people about their cultural obsessions and try to give some recommendations of my own. Welcome to Giving the Mic to the Wrong Person. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to Giving the Mic to the Wrong Person. To the wrong person. It's my own damn show. I can't even get, say the title right. We need to have all this. They always say you should always have this stuff written out, but you know, why? Uh, why put that much effort into it? I am your host, Jeremy, joined once again by folks who visited on a uh, lovely, not summer day here in uh, in Portland, Oregon, at our uh, scenic ba- uh, basement apartment recording studios. Joined today by three guests. Guests, will you please introduce yourselves? We'll start with the guy making noise off mic. I, I, I'm I'm Bernie Bernstein, intrepid Washington Post reporter. <laughs> if anybody has any hot scoops on on Roy Moore, I I, I pay good money for him. <laughs> uh, this is this is Jacob. I'm back, back again. Jacob, yeah. Tell us a little about yourself. Uh, well, I mean, what is there to say? I'm the social media coordinator for Barkles, the best damn dog ever. Check him out at the Real Barkles on Twitter. And he's also on Facebook, and he's posting regularly on Instagram now. And nice, he's he's doing good work. I'm proud of that dog. Awesome, awesome. Oh, I'm uh, Paul Guinan. I'm Jacob's uh, collaborator on 24 Hour Comic, the movie. Oh yeah, that too. I'm Scott McLeod, and I'm a cartoonist and author, best known for my book Understanding Comics. I came up with the 24 Hour Comic in 1990 as a challenge for my friend Steve Bissett. Let's see if each of us can draw 24 pages in 24 hours. Which is out on Hulu, on iTunes. It's a documentary about 24-hour comics. And Jacob and I sat at a Things from Another World a couple years ago, and uh, they had a little event. Get a bunch of artists into a room, lock them in there for 24 hours and see what they produce. What is your idea? It's based on this coffee table book that I did, Boilerplate, from the perspective of his inventor. It's sort of like a cross between Animal Farm and Walking Dead and Children of the Damned. Heist at a high school. It's a high school heist. At the time, there was a camera. I didn't know if anything would ever be done with it. I was excited that maybe I'll have some footage for something I could use in years from now. Oh, I thought you were saying that you didn't know there was a camera there. No, I mean, I didn't know that anything would be done with... I mean, like, yeah, sure, he's shooting stuff. Okay, mm-hmm. fine. How do you feel about being in the film? I think people are going to look at this and they're going to be like, that Jacob guy is an asshole. Fuck Jacob. Are we allowed to swear to this? Um, and then a couple years later, all of a sudden, I get contacted and it turns out we're in this movie. You didn't want to be in it. I was thrilled to be in it. Yeah. Uh, although at the time, I wish I'd known that it was going to turn into something because I would have engaged more. In the film, if you watch it, I'm, my head is just down. I'm just working, just working away. You would have thrown in some patter. I would have, yeah, exactly. Try to get some, sneak in some screen time. Totally. So, uh, but actually I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'll do the bio rundown. I've um, been working in comics for a couple decades. Worked for Marvel and DC and Dark Horse and First and all of those fun companies. And uh, I oh, did. Wow, First. That's where I got my start, at First Comics, as a staff artist, doing the very first manga translation ever, Lone Wolf and Cub. Oh, nice. I got to do the art corrects on that, so I would, I would take, I would, I would erase out those Japanese sound effects. Get out a th- insanely thin rapidograph pen, go in, do all the hatching that would, would have been underneath it, and then put an American sound effect over that. 
I was doing that for a couple of years. That was a lot of fun. Was that for, um that was was who was in charge of that? Well, that wasn't was that wasn't Marv Wolfman, was it? Who was the or Carl Maycheck? That was um No, no, the first comics guys it was uh, Rick Oliver, uh, executive uh, there was Rick Odaya, the publisher, Rick o, Rick Oliver, the editor in chief, Alex Wald, art director, uh Rick Taylor was the production manager on this who went on to become DC's production manager for a long long time. And, um, no, it was a tiny little outfit in Chicago in a basement, not unlike this. It was this little mom and pop outfit. Uh, but they had a couple of really groundbreaking, um, books that they published. For instance, American flag came out of first comics. And I think that's one of the most innovative books ever published. There was, um, you know, S Eisner did some, some innovative work in the forties and then Stranko did some innovative work in the sixties. But there was nothing since Duranko that really changed the design work of the comic book page until Chaikin came around. And he even was influenced by Walter Simonson's work on Manhunter mm. in, in terms of these, you know, like a bunch of little panels, you know, uh, graphic designs with uh, the sound effects in ways that had not been done before. And uh, so First Comics was an amazing place to work at because we were small enough that there wasn't this intense pressure to compete in this market, which was brand new at the time. The direct sales market was a brand new thing. That's why we had companies like First Exist, Eclipse, Kimiko, Now. Um, oh, man. Deep cuts. Yeah. Yeah. These were all these companies that popped up because of this new direct sales market created by an unsung hero of comics named Phil Suling, a East Coast um, marketer, uh, distributor, who invented, essentially, the direct market system and the modern convention as we know it today. So talk about tangenting. So anyway, I'm at First Comics. I uh, my first inking, my first professional gig was uh, outside of that Lone Wolf and Cub was inking Grimjack over Tom Sutton. Oh boy! And then and then I went off and did freelance work. Wound up doing creating a series for Dark Horse called Heartbreakers, which was the first female action hero where the where the where the women are not in a superhero outfit with superpowers, where they're just street clothed and just using like martial arts or guns or whatever. What year was that? That would be 1987, okay, 88, somewhere like that. And then, um, and then after that, uh, I became a darling at uh, Dark Horse for a while and did all of their movie books. I did um, Aliens and Terminator and Predator and all that stuff. And then uh, got tired of doing work for hire kind of stuff. I was sort of encouraged by my my um, my work that I did with Heartbreakers, a creator own thing. So I I left t for an opportunity which I was given by the great Marv not Marv Wolfman I'm sorry Archie Goodwin there we go. who is uh, one of the greatest editors who ever lived in comics and before he died he did one last series and I was brought in to do it he he had seen my work from because I've been bouncing around conventions he'd seen my work he'd known my interest in history and he wanted to do uh, a time traveling character for DC that would allow them to continue to essentially renew the copyrights on like character like their western characters or their medieval characters or whatever try and figure out a title that would resurrect these characters so I'm a big history buff so he knew that and so he brought me in to draw it and he brought in uh, John Francis Moore to write it and it was called Kronos and that ran for about a year or so, and that was just a, just a wonderful gig to work on. I was really, really proud of that series. And um, then, af then after that, I, I, you know, that was that was the top of the pyramid for work for hire. I mean, like as growing up as a DC kid, what's I can't get any better than creating my own character for the DCU. That was it. So I was, so I sort of checked that bucket list, and then I decided to just do create our own stuff. I never looked back at doing work for hire. Unfortunately, comics is the worst paying gig you can possibly have as an illustrator. Even pays less than doing spot illustrations for free weeklies. So, uh, in terms of the time that you spend, and so, um, so I, as I started to do create our own stuff, I would have to supplement it with gigs doing video game designs or storyboards for TV commercials or you know things like that that actually pay real money. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, and then. <laughs> Jeez, I just go on forever. So then, so then I said I decided to keep pushing uh, the idea of, of um, visual narrative. And about ten years ago, or actually more like fifteen years ago, I came up with this uh, robot character named Boilerplate that I was going to do as a graphic novel because that's where my you know I've been comic books all my life. Um, but as I started to work on it, I got about thirty pages in and realized I wanted to take a different approach. And I remembered um, the kind of visual histories I grew up with as a kid, those time life books where they're just profusely illustrated and have columns of text and i thought this is the way to go so i started to create fake photos and ephemera to tell the story of this robot from 100 years ago presented as a history book as if this character really existed 
And uh, that did very, very well for us. And it gave us an opportunity to, um, my wife um, wrote it with me, Anina Bennett. <coughs> she also co-created the Heartbreakers with me. In fact, she, uh, we've pretty much collaborated on every work for any, every, every creator-owned project that I've ever done. She has been my writer on it um, and brought the heart, the brain to the piece. I usually come up with like a plot, some action sequence I want to do. And then she actually presents, she actually fills the piece out with character, subtext, theme. Like Amazing. <laughs> We're going to put a put a bit on that and just and our third guest. Sorry about oh, that. No, 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 no it's no, fine. No, no. I, no, that was my fault. I should have. <laughs> no. I went. I introduced the wrong way. <laughs> I, I, no, he needs to keep going. Right. I, 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 I want to hear more about his. Wind me up. I'll wife. keep going. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, this is Natasha, resident fangirl, and uh, yeah. Hey. Hey. Well, well, no, I'm resident fangirl. <laughs> oh, are we going to fight over this? Yes. Okay, we're going to have a we're going to have a death match after this. We should no. play. We should play uh, Overwatch. Uh, you, well, yeah. Overwatch match. Oh yeah, sure. Because you know I haven't played it yet. <laughs> okay, this is gonna work really well for oh, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But, um. Okay, so with that out of the way. Well, wait, wait. wait. No, no, no. Oh no, go please, on. Oh, sorry. Please, Natasha, continue. continue. No. Well, why, what, what am I? I I've got nothing to say. I just want to know more about like how how long have you and your wife been married? Um forever. Yeah. Twenty 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 five years. Oh, well, oh yeah. wonderful. Should we we met before either of us were in the comic book industry mm -hmm. and um i got my job at first comics she was doing you know regular jobs because you know of course working in comics is not a real job <laughs> and um and uh when i left the company she was brought in as an editor because uh, their policy was is that you can't have you know people with relationships working on staff oh, yeah. at the same time but they they had known of her from my working there and telling everybody how great a writer she was and they saw some of her work and uh so they hired her so so her first professional gig was also at first comics as an editor and then when first comics folded dark horse uh hired her to come out to portland and work on staff for them as i think only their second female editor diana schutz being the first and at the time i think there was literally four or six female editors in comics at that time that yeah. would be uh it was that was it and she and anina also uh was one of the founders of the Friends of Lulu, which was a, uh, a um, organization, the first comic book organization to try and get more women into comics. Again, this is the 80s. You know, this yeah. is when that thing was, you know, there was no real no participation. Right, yeah. exactly. So, uh, and so, yeah, we've been uh, working together for, yeah, a couple of decades now. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. It's a, it's a great thing because, you know, you, people talk about at a certain point with your collaborators, you get like that... Uh, you know, um, secondhand mm -hmm. kind of thing, or you know, it's just these sort of psychic powers, mm -hmm. and you know, each other, and, and that totally applies. It's it's really uh, pretty special. Although the project that I'm just starting now is my first solo project, writing wise. Yeah, I'm working with another artist on my latest thing. So uh, so that's an interesting thing to take on a project for the first time ever, without her participation. Without her yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or she's she'll be an editor on it. Yeah, I mean, she's totally checking my shit. So uh, yeah. yeah, is she going to say is yeah. she going to be like official editor or oh, just yeah. unofficial editor? No, or? absolutely. Even, okay. I mean, even uh, when we shop it to whoever, I mean, she'll come with that package. Like whoever the publisher winds up being, they won't have to hire any editor. It'll then be able to be built into the piece. So gotcha. Uh, well, let's uh, then. Let, I guess let's talk about your current project after our. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll just dominate this thing. No, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> well, he'll. He, well, it's like it's. He know he. Uh, he knows he'll jump in whenever. Okay. And she'll kind of and uh, Natasha will either jump in or right. I, I will. Because sure. I will. I tend to hang back and okay. at least uh, let her ask questions too. Well, so my, the thing that thing people that really don't understand about Barkles is that he's really an element of force. <laughs> And he is well. He's a dog. He's, yeah. He's, but I mean, he's not. He's not just a dog. He's the dog. He's the quintessential dog, and you know that that's very important to understand when you're going into his work. And Barkles dot dog is the website coming soon. Barkles dot dog. Yeah. And I'm, they, they, I'm hoping we can get a boilerplate team up. You? Oh, absolutely. Sure. Nice. Absolutely. Barkles sure, and boilerplate. Yeah. Sure, I love it. Well, if you look in the boilerplate book in the back section, there's all of these little ancillary things that uh, that were produced at went long after boilerplate disappeared in World War One. And one of them was a Saturday morning cartoon pilot done by Hannah Barbera with a character sheet drawn by Alex Toth. And in it, you'll see Boilerplate's robot dog. Oh, was no. that actually drawn by Alex Toth? <laughs> no. no. Oh, I was going to freak out. 
<laughs> no, it was actually like, that's a hell of a get. No, yeah. it was done by uh, one of my uh, uh, fellow uh, Helioscope members, uh, Jesse Ham, who uh, is a Toth um, um, master. He's a, like you know historian. Breaks down his artwork uh, in his Patreon uh, page. Is uh, so you know I had to like I can't get Toth. So I, you go, when you can't get Toth, go get Jesse Ham from Helioscope. So. Yeah. So what are you working on? Well, I'm uh, starting a new thing, uh, far too ambitious, uh, called Aztec Empire. And I called it that because it's about that. This is something that I learned recently with the cacophony of pop culture is, is that you should have a title that kind of sort of explains your shit. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just going to get lost. And so I had had all these clever titles for the, you know, all kinds of things. But, Such as, well, there's like blood gods. I was because uh, because both both sides have these gods where they do some kind of blood something sacrifices, yeah. and and I was told that if you have the word blood or death in your in your book, it, it like there's a there's a percentage push of in terms of sales. Image is right. contractually like, obligated right. to pick up your title. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's image right. comics. Right. Image comics. Right. Another one I had was matanza, which is the Spanish word for massacre. Um, but I just went with Aztec Empire, so that when people say, what's it about? I can say, it's about the Aztec Empire. But specifically about the fall of the Aztec Empire to Cortez and his band of 500 mercenaries. Um, it's a unique story. Uh, there's, no, there's no story like it in the, in the history of this planet. I'm a big history buff. I'm a big science fiction buff. So I wanted to do something that had a fantastical element to it that like, was just unbelievable, literally unbelievable. Um, and this was the story that attracted me because um, as it, it, mankind separated at birth for 10,000 years. So one side of the planet, it's actually not one planet. We have two planets. One, one side of the planet is Asia, Europe, Africa, which all know about each other since the dawn of time. Marco Polo, Alexander, all the trade routes. The other side is the Americas. And that's literally an alien world from, from the perspective of, of, of the other side of the planet. And so they didn't meet until the 16th century. And by that time, they both had these civilizations. So it's to me, it's like a it's like a mirror mirror episode of Star Trek. A rogue starship shows up and decides to take over a world. It's effectively yeah, it's it's like world history as first contact story. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's I, I regard it as an alien first contact story because in, in in my work, a lot of the stuff that I do isn't specifically a it isn't because of my interest in the lead subject. So, for instance, my my robot book, I don't have a particular interest in robots. That was a vehicle to tell stories, adventure stories about history that people should, I thought people should know and I wanted to share. Same thing with this news story is I don't have a particular fascination with Mesoamerican culture. It's about the clash of cultures uh, on this global, uh, on a, with a global impact. You know, this, this giant epic with a cast of thousands, which changed, literally changed the world. I mean, I cannot understate that. It changed the world. And there is no story that comes close. And it's never been represented visually. So there is no TV show. There's no movie. There's no comic book series. Anything that you've ever seen is usually set against the backdrop of that story, not the story itself. And it's from the perspective of the Aztecs. It's from both sides. Okay. Yeah, I want to, I want to, I want to, and, and there's no, they're both, they both are indefensible in, in a lot of ways. So there's, it's like, it's like a story of villains versus villains. Yeah. But I don't want to make the story too rough or too dark that you would want to just put it down after a few pages. It has to be engaging. So it has to entertain first and then say whatever it's going to say. Oh. And then hopefully I I don't want to try and... I mean, you, cannot, you can never escape your own perspective when you tell a story. That's just never going to happen. But I want to try as much as possible to be a neutral party in it and allow the actions of the characters to to influence your opinion so like you decide was you know this thing i'm showing you is that a good thing or a bad thing yeah a lot of people forget about that episode of star trek where kirk enslaved a planet took their dilithium took a bunch of women as slaves and started cutting off ears of anybody who protested that's right that's right yeah the private little war i remember yeah. that episode <laughs> Harlan, i think harlan olsen wrote it it was it was nominated it was good up uh, yeah that's right <laughs> banned for years in texas i think or something yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So this is a. Uh, it's 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 just a crazy project though because it's six hundred pages and that was chopped down from my original draft of twelve hundred pages. Oh, wow. <laughs> so uh, this thing is a freaking epic, but it's a beautifully self-contained story. And as there's all kinds of surrealist elements in it that, if you were to read it as fiction, you would put it down and go, "This is too unbelievable. Too many coincidences. Too many. You know. Oh, that's a. That's just too perfect or too cute. Or too ironic." And um, so I have to present it as 
factually as possible. So every episode, every chapter will have end matter explaining every single page will have notes saying this is from this source. This is why mm -hmm. this, this is why I made this choice. Um, because otherwise if I try to include, you know, if I try to fictionalize it or include composite characters, it would undercut the surrealness of the actual events. Yeah, because that story in itself is very weird, and mm -hmm. I'm sure it's been researched extensively, so you have a lot of sources. Oh, yeah, I've got a, a huge bibliography yeah. Yeah, of, 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 of stuff on it, yeah. That yeah. was one of the things I really appreciated about Lone Wolf and Cub, which is that there's a lot of back matter in there yeah. where it talks about like the old types of weapons. And I mean, like the story of Lone Wolf and Cub is clearly insane, but yeah. it it gets very into like the old structures and traditions and the society and uh, there's a lot of stuff in there about the weaponry which i'm super into yeah well and they really go to town with the philosophies in that i remember um you know when i was working on that series you know my head was spinning over some of the some of the uh, sort of religious concepts not just bushido but like you know my fumado yeah you yeah, know yeah. yeah yeah that yeah my fumado yeah, yeah exactly yeah. Have either of you guys seen the uh, the new Ta Takashi Miike, um the adaptation of Blade of the Immortal yet? No, no. I've seen the trailers. It looks great. It nope. is. It's it's two hour. It's two hours. A little bit more than two hours. But, you, but watching that, you can. You, uh, I did not know going into it that they were adapting the entire. They were compressing the entire story because I remember I was watching it and like, oh wait, this is yeah. We're we're hammering through. It's like at some point we're, you know, so used to, so used to seeing kind of like whoop, sprawling adaptations that try to, that try to force everything down into a fe into a feature length, a single feature length. Yeah, like Akira. Yes. Mm -hmm. That at some point it's like, yeah, the, you know, the, um, the mechan you know, it's like the mechanism in the back of my head that is just used to like filling in like, okay, this must, you know, it's like at some point I have to do like a lot of like heavy, heavy lifting in the back of my head of like filling in like, okay, well, this, well, this must, this must, you know, it's like, I, I can see where this is, where this would tie into like other, you know, issues of content or something, but it all gets cut down. The reason I bring up uh, Blade of the Immortal aside from it's, it is another adaptation of manga is that unlike with say, uh, Lone Wolf and Cubs uh, uh, cinematic adaptation, like I think, which was uh, released here as Shogun Assassin. Right, they cut the first two or three movies into a single film, and actually, I really dig it because oh. it's just nonstop action. They yeah. don't care about the story; it's just one set piece to another. Yeah, the um, they screened it one of the Grindhouse nights at the Hollywood Theater. But the thing, but the, what I what I missed from Shogun Assassin to Blade of the Immortal is that the, you do not get the uh, the arterial sprays <laughs> that which which work really I mean yeah it's, which is like I said it's they're hyper stylized yeah. and they're like Sam Raimi levels of blood but um like they work they work so I found out they work so well as like punctuation because there's a particular rhythm of the of the beats in Shogun Assassin that the, the the, the punctuation is not there as much. It's like the timing is different, but it's missing the little bit of it's missing a couple little bits in Blade of the Immortal that they had in Shogun Assassin. One of the things actually I enjoy about the Lone Wolf and Cub films and the, Sh and the Shogun Assassin, as opposed to more recent uh, samurai films, is that the old school samurai films, especially Kurosawa, um, these master swordsmen are so badass that it's just one or two moves and and something happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, where it's not this endless sort of Errol Flynn and Basil Rathbone running up and down stairs. It's, you know, it's like boom, 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 it's over. And and that, I know that modern action audiences are like, wait a minute, <laughs> can, can we have another one of those scenes right. soon? <laughs> That's the, yeah, at some point it's almost like it, you go, it goes from, from Kurosawa, then you have a deliberate constraining of, to, of like, you know, grace and only like three moves to say... Someone who watched, you know, who who famously watched too many Kurosawa films, felt that and felt the need to put a forty-five minute long sword action sequence <laughs> in the last film that he directed. Yep. It's over, Anakin. I have the high ground. Um, We're shaming George Lucas right now. That yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. That uh, that that at one point they had to, they I think that even the filmmakers were just kind of like taught, kind of like just mentioned like oh yeah, we, it's kind of a thing we you know. We had to keep thinking, coming up with things for them. I mean, at some point, I should cut in if I can ever remember where this line. Somebody we interviewed about to talk about this line, talking about how we need to come up with like things for them to do to fill out forty-five minutes of like running up or not and doing all this shit. Right, but but at some point during the production, the uh, coordinator, a stunt coordinator, or the effects guy, was saying I uh, was referring to an, uh, uh, some kind of study that he had 
read or heard about how an audience will only take about five to seven minutes before they start shutting down before this before if, even if it's spectacular it's like well you know you can only take so much of that before before you just before it becomes meaningless yeah yeah well and a lot of it i think depends on people's past experience and where the medium is at i remember a lot of people were complaining about the born identity when it came out and i rewatched that very recently and i found the fights very easy to follow and i remember being a little bit overwhelmed by them at the time because there's just a whole lot of cuts and a whole lot of fast moves and i was like okay so now he's doing this now he's doing this it's, and there's a there's an ebb and flow to the fight that i don't think i really appreciated the first time i saw it well that's key is the ebb and flow yeah. absolutely and and but i've been exposed yeah. to you know 10 years of media since the original came out so like I, my brain is wired a little differently now so i can actually appreciate what's going on right Right. And one thing I did want to get back to is, like I said, we can branch off to like a thousand different topics. One of the bits is um, that, that actually I just thought of about, but it's um, let's let's take a quick break. I want to come back. I do want to ask about the if the efficacy of teaching history through comics. Ooh, sure. Well, I'm you know, there's not really that much history in Barkles, although we do have a really funny Titanic reference in the latest installment. So nice. oh, you were talking to nice. Paul. Okay. Nice. Well, we all know that Barkles comics are main, primary. You you want to you Barkles are are mainly you 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 really want to you're uh, you're aiming for crowd pleasers much more than a, a, a pedagogical intent. <laughs> oh no, they are absolutely anti dog treatises. But you know, I thought they I, transcended genre. I thought you actually had time travel involved too. So well, I mean, you he, could teach he's a examples. complex and multifaceted character. Yeah. But I guess we're going on break. So yeah, yeah. All right. go to lunch. Will you go to lunch? Yeah, go to lunch, and we'll be right back. All right. Break time. Oh, man, that was a Kevin Spacey reference. I, I should not be doing those. You're not allowed to make those anymore. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Jeremy here. Hoping you've been enjoying our conversation with Paul Guinan. I want to let you know that Paul has a Patreon account now where you can help fund his new graphic novel, Aztec Empire. You can find that at www.patreon.com slash Guinan. It's Guinan, G-U-I-N-A-N. I also wanted to ask if you've been enjoying our show and would like to show your appreciation, you can contribute to our own Patreon at patreon.com slash giving the mic, or just subscribe and leave us a review at iTunes. You'd be surprised how something as little as a review can help us out a lot. And now back to the show. Are you familiar with God is Dead, the Jonathan Hickman project? Uh, It sounds familiar. No, remind me. Uh, it's basically well. We should probably talk about it when okay. we're here, but sure. it actually gets into some Aztec stuff. So oh, okay, um, all right. And, and we, uh, me and Pete, just finished up the latest installment of Barkles, uh, Barkles in Hell. Uh, Does he need Hell? What? <laughs> if only we could sneak in, you know, references to our, to you know, uh, not not big Harvey, time, Harvey. not big time DC Marvel characters, but it'd be nice if there was some kind of you know like a little bit more of a, a slacking for some of our favorite independent characters where like Hellboy can make an appearance. <laughs> oh, I thought, I thought you were going to say like Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes, he's in hell, isn't he? Larry Gonick. That's what I need to remember. Larry Gonick. Oh, right. Yes, the the history cartoonist. Yeah, I like his stuff. It's, 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 it's... I... He's the cartoon history of the universe guy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and he's done a bunch of little sort of cartoon history of this, that, and the other. I've only read the, his first one. It was, it was pretty solid, so... Yeah. yeah, this one is called Barkles, colon, One Hell of a Dog. Yeah. Oh, right, yes. Putting yes. the finishing inks on it right now. Does the hell have little flames coming off it in the lettering? Uh, yes. Actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Bar- Barkles eats a bunch of uh, uh, chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it turns out that it's not as bad as people think. Grapes apparently are the destructive. What? Grapes. Oh no. Okay. Chocolate is not that bad. You have to like the dog has to eat a, a serious amount. About your water? Yes, thank you. Was like anybody refresh your tea or anything? I'm good. Water? Thanks. Well, Barkles uh, is not known for his restraints. So. Right. Yeah. It's a definitely. brick. A brick of chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Kickstarter plush toy is that coming? Oh man, we should. We got we've got big plans. Actually, um, where's my phone? I uh, we are kind of biting on your material a little bit. I'm not proud. That's, that's all good. People and people you know enjoy their shit and want to share it and reference it and be influenced by things. It's all good. It's all one giant stirring pot of cauldron of whatever creativity so here is uh here here here's 
We, we've been doing one of these a week. <laughs> oh, that's cute. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But I'm absolutely. Okay, I'm going to follow you. Is it under Barkles? Uh, it's uh, the real Barkles. The real Barkles. Yeah. All right, I'll that's follow right. you. You may not have been aware of this, but Barkles actually played a crucial role in this historic event, working tirelessly for nearly a decade with parties from both sides. Leading to his legendary televised speech, Mr. Gorbachev, bark, 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 bark. <laughs> He's Look a good dog. Aww. It's good taking out Lassie, getting him in there. What? I don't... Who's Lassie? Lassie doesn't exist. I don't know who that is. Yeah. I've never heard of this. Yeah, that's good. Did you see... Yeah. The, you know, they, they made, they made an, an, an in-world, an in-universe version the of Lassie for the new Wolfenstein game? Oh, Jesus. Like Lysel or something, and it's like a, it's like a Nazi robot dog. Oh, okay. my God. They, like, film little bits on... Uh, Little, Things uh, I never thought I'd hear. Nazi robot dog. I'm I love it. Playing the first yeah. Wolfenstein game, mm -hmm. not the very first one, but the first of the reboot, and that's that's really interesting because it has a bunch of alternate universe stuff, like a Nazi version of the Beatles. Oh my god! <laughs> they're they're, they're <laughs> really committing to the bit. Alternate oh, universe oh, stuff. Man. I, I love like that. Like that. Well, you know, uh, the Beatles did release uh, some songs in German. When they were at the beginning, because well, because that was part of their market. Hamburg they played in Germany. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, they, so, so they did a couple of German songs. They did like three shows a night while hopped up on speed. The opening, the opening scene in the first issue of Kronos is uh, takes place at the uh, at the Indra Club in Hamburg. I don't know how I miss oh, wow. Kronos. Like I've read so everybody much did. stuff, nobody, and nobody. like I've read I read that Aztec thing that. Uh, <laughs> oh right, Aztec with a Z. Yeah, Aztec, and, with a K. I, yeah, the K. yeah. With a K. And well, there's tech. also a Z. There, where he's, so where he's, he's dressed like Electro from the Marvel Universe. Kind of? uh, yeah, yeah, he's yeah, kind of like a cross that. between Electro and the and the and the Ray. The Ray. That's yeah, right. Yes. Some of the others. That's and, right. The Ray. Nice. Yeah. nice. That that was. Uh, I want to say that was like a Grant Morrison Mark Miller jam. I I know Mark Miller worked on it. I don't. I, I want to say Morrison was collaborating, but I'm not 100 percent on that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that you know. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it had very little to do with any the right. actual culture. It's yeah, just, yeah. Chrono Spanish will slip by me somehow. Yeah, and and, and I've, I'm t it's, uh, it's a little bit of heartbreak because uh, Chrono. Well, I actually maybe we should get online for this. Or the... I'm going on. Are we live? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> the thing, no, I, I never. Yeah. The, uh, well, and and we're back. Okay. Yeah, I never, I, like I said, I never turn off the record because right. you never know what you're going to miss. Well, the 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 thing I, that disappointed me about Cronus is that uh, it was it wasn't canceled. Uh, John Francis Moore had some opportunities to write some write for Hollywood, so he had been doing some scripts for the Flash TV show with uh, Howard Chaykin. Oh boy! So he, you know, Chaykin working on the the Flash TV show. Yeah, the, the only the original decent, one. The only decent yeah, the, episodes of the yeah the '90s Flash. The only decent episodes are ones that were written by Chaykin and Moore. Yeah, I remember that was that was I remember yeah. for, I remember I. I would tape every episode of freshman year. Right. So on no, I mean and I'll defend, you know, at least I don't know, they they did a season of twenty episodes, something like I'll defend at least three or four of those episodes. I think there you know, there's a few solid ones in there. Um but uh but the thing that disappointed me about the uh, uh Kronos is that when Moore left, uh Carlin was editor at the time and because uh, uh oh right, uh, is that uh Archie Goodwin started the series but he passed away um um halfway through the series. Uh, the series is run and here's the creepy part uh i was working on a cover for issue five which has the new chronos standing at the grave site of the old chronos so i'm drawing a guy standing at a grave and i get the call that archie goodwin has is, is, is passed away and uh, that took the wind out of me he was my you know as close as you get to a mentor in comics that i'd had and um so Mike Carlin took over, and uh, he was prepared. He told me, so I'm prepared to run with this series forever. It doesn't matter what the sales are, because this is an important um, thing for our larger universe. As I was describing earlier, you know, about how they could they could resurrect minor characters and renew the copyright in, in by publishing. Mm -hmm. IP farm, yeah. Right, IP farm. So, exactly. So, uh, but once the writer left, um, uh, there was, you know... It was people, you know, there was a discussion about it, and I was, you know, I pitched myself to take it over as writing, but everybody realized that writing and drawing it, I just would never be able to make those monthly deadlines. So they decided, okay, let's just wrap it up. And so, uh, so it had the super abrupt last issue that just wrapped everything up. 
you know, the way that like Jericho had these extra six episodes to wrap up their whole, you know, giant oh, epic yeah. story. No, that's a DC uh, tradition. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, but, but it all got wrapped up before we got into the Aztec part of the story because Kronos is half Aztec and his outfit is Aztec. And his 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 time portal thing is 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 the sun is the sunstone, which people refer to as the Aztec calendar, which is it's not really a calendar; it's sort of a calendar. Anyway, um, so we had we didn't really get into that, and uh, so I, I sort of <laughs> that was that was the one frustrating thing about that series. And of course, you know, if anybody ever uh, DC editorial ever decides to resurrect that series, I will drop everything I'm doing, even my own damn Aztec creator own series and i will go right back to that semi work for hire i will go back to that work for hire i have a tiny piece of this character if it's ever turned into anything <laughs> i got offered uh to pitch something for uh one of the dark horse anthologies actually me and pete and we i put together like a half dozen ideas and i actually uh, it never part of the reason it never happened was because i immediately pulled back like a couple of those because i thought they were really strong concepts and just as far as the ownership goes like i need i wanted to be able to revisit these ideas at a later time and have some creative control over them and like the the way that the contracts worked out like they, that was just not going to happen i wasn't i'm not complaining about it but like you know these are in my opinion really good ideas and i'm not just going to give them away right? mm -hmm. pete uh pete your creative partner and co-creator of barkles correct yeah pete solomon mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. right um you know yeah, just, it was, oh, sorry, go no, on. I was going to say it just feels very exploitative. Um, yeah, I was going to say, oh, artistic labor is entitled to all it creates. Yeah, I mean, there's, again, as I was mentioning earlier, if you're going to do your own thing, you're probably going to have to supplement it with stuff that you're not as happy about doing. But that's, you know, that's the balance. That's the seesaw that you've got to, that you've got to sit on. Yeah, well, there have been a couple of people who have said, I, I think Mark Miller has actually remarked on this, that he has made way more money off of his creator owned material than he ever did off of even extremely lucrative gigs like the ultimates well if you and if you build up enough of a body of work and it sells you know and you keep your stuff in print i mean you can you can see residuals or, or whatever royalty checks you know from something that you did 10 years ago mm -hmm. you know so yeah so the, the key is is well for any artist the key is output you know just just get you know just buckle down Stop playing those fucking video games and get onto your drawing board. Get back onto your word processor. <laughs> you feel, you feel, do you feel personally attacked right now? Well, I mean, I, 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 I'm going to draw comics about playing video games. Hi, I'm Kenny. I'm 14 years old, and I love to play those damn video games. So I feel like oh, I'm there you go. the yeah. difference. Research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. Welcome to the, hist welcome to the history of, of 2000s era webcomics, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you about Joe Madeira. <laughs> Well, that actually just made me think of that uh, the reason that Portland is the mecca of comics is because in the 90s, Richardson, who is a collector and who has a, like warehouses filled with all kinds of fun stuff, um, decided to uh, collect talent. So uh, he, he would invite people not just to work for his company, to write and draw for his, for his uh, Dark Horse, but also to come and live in Portland. So uh, so when when Anina and I were, were moved out here, that was part of a wave of people that he brought out here to live here. And like any classic immigrant pattern, you know, once the initial people find success and they tell, tell their friends and their relatives, and all of a sudden the snowball effect and people, more and more people started moving here. Yeah. How many comics companies are based in and around Portland nowadays? We have Dark Horse. Mm -hmm. Oni. Oni. Uh, Image there, Comics yeah. is now officially here. Isn't there like isn't there like a top shelf office around here? Or? There sort of technically is. There was for a long time, but top shelf is kind of shuttered. Okay. Kind of more or less. I mean, I, I I don't know exactly what the what their current publishing thing is, but uh, but they're yeah not as not as. What about how much of it is in? I can't. How much boom is located here versus like San Diego or something or? I think they're mostly San Diego. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. San okay. Diego. Yeah. I mean, and uh, and then just up by five, we have Fanographics in Seattle. So there's a lot of stuff going on here on the West Coast, and and, and of course DC moved all their operations out to L.A. Uh, I think Marvel needs to stay in New York because that's their brand. All their heroes live in New York. They right. gotta, they gotta stay. They can't. They can't be moving out to L.A. No West Coast Avengers. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, yeah, the entire. Um... I was just fiddling around with with talking about comics and video games, fiddling around on on Steam last night, and just and saw that they just came out with a brand new uh, Mar uh, Lego Marvel Superheroes game, and um, 
the only reason I'm bringing this up is that the the very first Marvel like Lego like kind of big sprawling open world game, the open world that you are wandering around in is Marvel's New York, mm-hmm. wherever you know you get, like, you drive around you know hey driving by um, the Baxter Building yeah but all that stuff and so it's kind of like yeah that's kind of they're they're, they're stuck you know there's uh the the, <laughs> the particularities of the early 20th century public in, uh, public publishing industry is kind of embedded into uh, Marvel Comics that's right yeah it's East Street. Yeah, a lot of a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And um, using that as a rough transition point back to uh, talk about like comics and history, I didn't want to want to ask about because uh, this has been something that I've been thinking about. I think for a couple of years now, of just the um, similar to it's kind of and this is and this is stuff that even like you know Will Eisner has been t- you know wrote about. What eight decades ago, the uh, the educational and you know the uh, the, the educational uh, abilities, uh, instructional abilities of just using like you know comics to teach st- teach stuff to people. Yeah, Will Eisner actually drew some um, manuals for the army when he was in the, in the forties. I have the bo- I have the collected book on the bookshelf over there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I think Scott McLeod talks about how there have actually been studies that show that sequential art is actually a fantastic medium for education. I, I, I absolutely it is, and, and and I'm so happy that recently teachers have come around to that because for a long time, you know, when comics were just you know regarded as this adolescent medium that shouldn't be taken seriously, and so we got to a point in our education system where teachers are desperate for any device that will inspire their students, you know, to read or learn about whatever topic, and if that if that takes a graphic novel to do that, so be it. Yeah, that's well, that's always been, I mean. After after I left DC and started just doing my own stuff in a, in a very serious way, what do I want to do with my career? Um, I wanted to do something in which you learned something, in which you got some kind of meat. It wasn't just a confection, right? You know, where, where there's some protein there. SoundCloud and, wrapper edification. <laughs> yeah. There it is. There it is. And 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 actually, just recently, Twitch uh, Twitch movie stream. <laughs> well, and, and I'm especially committed because just recently I. I discovered the meaning of life, and, and so I'm 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 very, and I'm very excited to, to share it with you today, and that is to learn and then to teach, and this works on a microbiology level, DNA. That's what cells are doing when they reproduce, all the way up to a civilizational level. That's what we're doing as civilizations. We build upon the past, you know, what we've learned and and how to improve ourselves. So, so this that kind of thing, and it even you know, isn't the philosophy of Star Trek, you know, to better yourself and, and help others. This sounds like a really elaborate excuse for cultural appropriation to me. But... <laughs> <laughs> that's why my first big history project was about a white guy in, in Chicago. Because <laughs> that's, that's how I started. I'm a white guy who grew up in Chicago. <laughs> well, all right, what well, you know. Exactly. Yeah. What part of Chicago? Uh, uh, in and around the north side, uh, Lincoln Park area, uh, Yep. How? What? You, what, uh, what era did the Lincoln Park era change? If it, or was it? Has it? Has it always been that bad? Oh no no no! The Lincoln Park actually is the nice uh, part of the North Side. There's there's. Well, uh, no, that's well, that's what I meant. What time did it? Has it always been? Oh yeah, like Wicker anything, Park. What? Anything near the lake is always desirable. Okay. Yeah. Ex- except where there's like a, a, a little strip on the far north side of Chicago near the lake where there's not really much beach. It's just basically concrete, and that's that's the that's the one little bit of real estate which is not as desirable because you don't you can't just walk to a beach. Gotcha. <laughs> Because I can remember visit. I remember visiting Chicago. You know, I grew up in Flint and Ann Arbor. Uh, lived there for twenty eight years. Uh, but I can remember visiting Chicago in like ninety nine or ninety nine, two thousand, two thousand one or so, when um, like when <laughs> when a lot of noise was getting. You know, it was being made about just the increasing you know gentrification of the North Side. Oh well, that's happening across the board. I mean, right. most famously these days here in Portland. Right. Yeah, I mean that's something that you can never escape, right? It's but just... uh, and I think it, yeah, it was happening, the, you know, similar but a slightly slower rate in at the same time. In you know, same things were happening in like Ann Arbor and and in uh, in in Austin. I'm just curious about like when did it when did it particularly hit? Because at some point it's like a big, you know it hit like certain rates in certain cities like different after each other. Well, it, for you know it's it's difficult to notice them because the scale of the city. And then living there, it's difficult to notice that. You, you, you'll see, you know, something happen, a development in a small area, but it's it's pretty spread out. So, so you don't notice it as much as you do in a smaller town, where 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 if where if a developer gets control of a, like an entire city, like for instance, 
in Portland here in Division Street. Oh my God! The yeah. developers got got control of entire city blocks to refashion, and uh, that that's much more dramatic when you when you see that happen, as opposed to you know a building here, a building there, spread out over you know a scale of something like Chicago. Mm -hmm. And and but you know once I left, yeah, I would see my hometown in snapshots when you go back to visit for holidays or whatever convention and that's when you start to notice those snapshots in time where you're like you're one one year you see this you know building the next year it's an empty lot the following year it's a brand new building so you know you see these little things just sort of pop up when i first moved to portland i was up near uh, the alberta area and i lived across the street from a black church and i would regularly go to a black coffee shop and i remember the first time i went there there were two people having this really excited conversation about moving to Africa and like just the really hard pitch. And I mean, that's, that's still a thing that is not uncommon. And I remember when I went to the gym, there was this uh, black Israelite church, which by the way, super weird. And they were always trying to get me to come in. And I was like, I'm not sure I'm, I'm black enough. And they're like, no, you're, you're fine. Come on in, come on in. Like, I, li you know. I lived, uh, I lived three blocks from that, uh, from that area for the first six years I, that I lived in Portland. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the, the that coffee shop has been gone for a long time. I think I think one of the churches is still there, but well, um, my my favorite coffee shop is Michael Ring's um, um, uh, uh, place on uh, Mississippi. Former yeah. guest of the show, yeah, yeah. And uh, that entire stretch of Mississippi uh, was the black commercial stretch. That was where you'd have the barber shops, the grocery stores, the mm -hmm. restaurant entirely up and down that street. You go back and you look at it now; it's it's a completely different situation in fact um there was um a well, guy on cnn I'm, I'm forgetting the guy's uh name did um united states of blackness and he did an episode w. About Kamal Bell. i had been to portland a lot as a comedian i performed there a lot i often noticed when i performed there weren't a lot of black people there and i knew it wasn't a very black city but there were so few i'm like something's weird here well thankfully because i had this tv show i was able to go to portland and investigate this right and he did an episode about portland and and, yeah. he, and he found a local that walked him up and down mississippi Okay, and so yeah. I'm guessing you, when you were a kid, you didn't come to Samurai Blue and get some no. sushi. You didn't. You weren't. You oh didn't come no, sushi, sushi was when you were was the last thing in the world when we were out here. <laughs> no sushi. Not a lot of sushi joints in the, in no, the whole neighborhood. Okay. So wait, Hilarious. you're trying to tell me that when you were a kid, they weren't selling kombucha on tap in your neighborhood? No, that's what you're trying to tell me. You didn't have no kombucha in the neighborhood. <laughs> and it was it was heartbreaking because in the in the background, you know, I say, oh, there's Bridge City. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Places like where well, this building is across the street here? Yeah. There was a little place called the, uh, the the wing shop. The wing shop. Yeah, he sold, you know, you get three chicken wings uh, and, a, and, a, and a couple of slices of toast. Okay, all and right. And it was $1.50. A $1.50? Yeah, man. How can was... you push that business out of the neighborhood? Yeah. <laughs> $1.50 for three wings and a slice of toast. Yeah, I'm telling you, man, it was crazy. But that building. That's all brand new building. That's all brand new. Everything is all brand new. And a lot of it is all brand new within, within the last five years. Yes, and the, the buildings that are still remaining, none of the same people. So the buildings that have been here, it's, not, it's all new tenants? It's all new tenants. I don't, okay. I don't think there's uh, one person that had a business here back in you know, the day that is still in business now. That's a damn shame. Yeah. That's a damn shame. Yeah. You wouldn't even know you're in the same neighborhood. I mean, it is that different. I mean, yeah, Michael actually talked about like the first couple of years of when they set this, when they, when he had when starting up the shop there in like Oh five or six, you, uh, you go over from, um, you go over a, a few blocks east of there to say North Williams where, you know, the, uh, where the, the I think it was around the area where the original, like, you know, like the, uh, the black Panther party headquarters were, and you can still see now there are still little monuments, like in the sidewalk, little mementos of where, like the it was something it was like the I can't remember what the actual title was, but it was like where they like the Fred Hampton Memorial, um, like where they would actually serve like you know the free breakfast program for local kids mm -hmm. in you know North Portland, fifty five uh, you know forty five years ago or so. Yeah, yeah. The most striking thing in my hometown was is that on the south side there was this giant, multi block like dozen square block open air market called Maxwell Street Market, and it was it was. Uh, um, primarily Hispanic, black, and this is where um, on Sundays they would bring out all these tables at the flea market. Uh, musicians would set up and play blues. And actually, you see this in 
Blues Brothers. Blues Brothers. Yep. There's a sequence where they go to go to Aretha Franklin's shot place, and you see John Lee Hooker playing boom, boom, boom. Right. And you see footage of, and that's Maxwell's. Yeah. And, and that's, that was a huge thing, and it's a huge sprawling thing. And, and, I, and my dad would take me there every weekend. It was it was a little ritual we would do, and that was taken over by the University of Chicago. They completely took out I mean, a dozen square blocks of stuff and put in essentially what. Division Street looks like now, you know, just these like you know these these flat ugly places. Yeah, yeah, Seven yeah. Eleven, and, and and so, so my, my dad uh, recently, you know, about five or ten years ago, he, he says, "Hey, let's go down to Maxwell Street," and he was like, he's like I, I, that doesn't exist anymore." Yeah, yeah, I know. Let's let's go. And and, and he was just messing with me because we did this all the time as a kid. So we went down to the corner of Maxwell and Halston, and it was totally unrecognizable. It was completely redeveloped. The only thing that would have made me realize that we were on that corner was the street signs. That was it. There was Halstead, there's Maxwell, but nothing else was there. And then over just a little off off the side of the street is a statue of a sitting blues musician. <laughs> that's all that's left is this bronze statue of this guy playing a guitar of what of what was once this giant huge, you know, market. I can't take it like that. So, gentrification, ladies and gentlemen, um, this is what happens when you don't de- when you don't decommodify your housing markets. Uh, coming to Portland right now. <laughs> It'll come to a city near you. Yeah. I it's, can't wait for the uh, Antifa super soldiers to just wipe all these white people out so we can take back our territory. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. If you want, yeah, a fun bit of history, people for Portland, uh, go look into the history and development of Legacy Emanuel Hospital. Hap- in fact, they, they're trying to expand like today again um, over in North Portland. Like this, this in the last couple of months, they've been making noise because they're not, they haven't been paying, paying back millions to the local business owners that were owed to. Um, yeah, it's a uh, mm. it is a fun topic that I need to get, I need to do an episode on at some point. Yeah. Also, Google Azatlan Pendejos. <laughs> Azatlan, nice yeah. reference. That's uh, yeah. People get uh, yes. There's right. there's your indigenous activist little coming up there. Little little, little bubble. <laughs> yeah, I mean you know it's, that, it's, it's not like you guys even want Arizona or New Mexico anyway. <laughs> like it's not like you're using them for anything. <laughs> What are, are the, we're, we're we're now we're we're now into the the segment of the show is talking about the Reconquista or <laughs> that, that was in Spain that was uh yeah the, actually that that was the prologue that was the the yeah the prologue to the conquest of Mexico was first Spain had to reconquer their own Iberian Peninsula from the Moors these uh, North African Arab dark skinned Arabs. Um, and uh, who were much more technologically advanced than the actual Spaniards themselves. Yeah, wasn't and, it like a religiously motivated too? Anyway. Oh right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're, sure. they're like freaky, they're like, like freaky. Yeah, freaky Catholic too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's yeah, it's it's the hardcore Catholics, and we're talking about you know the um, the Spanish Inquisition mm-hmm. uh-huh. uh, versus these Muslims. Uh, yeah, the the Catholic Muslim thing goes back to the dawn of time. Yep. Yep. And so and so what happened was is that they, they, they reconquered their Spain, they got it all together and they had all these the Aragon and Castile and everything all consolidated into this new thing called Spain. But they had all of these hype you know, they had all these guys all hopped up on the warfare and, and what are we gonna do with all these people? Oh, let's send them to the new world and you know, unleash them there. Yeah. So uh, so that's that's where the that's where the sort of the energy and drive comes from is is that these people, you know, coming off of this big war and like what, what's next? What else can we conquer? <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and speak. But going back to you know, as at I would do, want, did want to. One of the things I did want to uh, talk about, at least on Mike, was I'm curious if you could talk about the reactions that you've had to trying to you know covering to making an extended like history comic about you know just kind of you know just in, in the imperial invasion of uh, of Mesoamerica. Yep. Also, also, do you find the word uh, cracker as hurtful as the N word? <laughs> cracker. Cracker. I love crackers <laughs> with a little cheese on it. 
No, no, that's that's what's so ridiculous is that I don't think any white person particularly is like offended by cracker. That's, yeah, that's uh, we we got off we got off easy in the epithets in the in the human epithet department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I mean it has a K sound in it, so there's there's something there's a little sharp there, but that's about it. No, no, no. Actually, this is a I've this project is still pretty early in the scheme of things, so I've only gotten the first sort of glimpses of 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 possible reactions to the idea of a gringo such as myself doing a story about the Aztecs, but I, but you know, but like, but like, but has a, how some liberals split hairs on Obama. Well, he's not entirely black. He's only half black. So the, the Aztec empire story is only half, half brown. It's, we still got a bunch of, you know, sort of white Spaniards. Although my connection to 500 year old Iberian Catholics is about as removed <laughs> As you know, as, as as you know, my connection to you know Nahua Tenoch tribes, you know, five hundred years ago. So it's uh, to me the whole thing is is sort of I'm removed from both of those things. So I like to think I have some kind of third party perspective, but um, the key is is that is that so much of um, so much of the work done on Aztec history, specifically like archaeology. Uh, anthropology, you know, really serious academic approaches to to the subject. Well, these are all white folks mostly, you know, uh, coming out of the university of whatever, uh, doing you know anthropological work. So it's it at, at a certain point you have to sort of let go of of the messenger and focus on the message. As long as the people have done their homework, uh, you know, and 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 are authoritative and and what they're and what they're whatever point they're trying to make. I mean, that's as good as you can get because, I mean, there's, I mean, I know, you know, it doesn't, I, to me, it doesn't matter the skin color in terms of your expertise, you know, I mean, you know, there can be ignorant indigenous, there can be, you know, super smart, you know, who, who people who know exactly what they're talking about. It, 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 uh, it's, it's a tough call. So thankfully I've gotten both sides of it. So I've gotten um, an indigenous activist who was, who was starting to give me shit about some of the way that I was presenting my material, but they had not read, uh, they had not gone to my website and read my, you know, artist statements or my blog posts about this, but you know, which I have up, which I have up uh, to, to try and, you know, sort of counter any, any potential um, criticisms or at least address them, not necessarily counter them. Um, so the person who was giving me shit had not read through my stuff. So as soon as I gave them links, they said, well, here, read this and get back to me. They, they didn't get back to me. <laughs> and then on the other side of it, uh, I was making some kind of comment about colonialism on my Aztec Twitter feed, uh, which is Aztec Empire 1520. And uh, a Spaniard was giving me grief about like, oh, you know, you're... I, this this suggests that you're going to take the side of the Aztecs and that you're going to you know be unfair towards the <laughs> Spanish side of the story. And as soon as I got that message, I realized, oh, okay, all right, <laughs> I'm not going to win on either side. Don't so, engage with the Twitter Nazis. <laughs> so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do the best job as I can and let the chips fall where they may. The um, I have consulted with uh, several um, Mexican authorities on this subject and also just in pop culture. Like my favorite, um, I, I have. Uh, uh, my favorite comment came from uh, this political cartoonist, uh, Mexican political cartoonist who does work for the San Diego Tribune. Uh, his name is Lalo Alcazar. He was also the consultant on the upcoming Pixar Coco. Yes. And we had a nice conversation in San Diego. Uh, I went to his panel and we hung out afterwards. And uh, and I told him all about you know my concerns about this project and what he thought the reaction might be in Mexico. Because there is absolutely going to be a Spanish language version that's key to this piece. And he said to me, and I'll always remember this, he said, indigenous activists are going to jump all over you, but the average Mexican is going to love it. And that's all I needed. That was validation enough for me, because that guy knows us. I mean, he's very, very, I mean, he's very vocal about his politics. I mean, that's his living. He's a political cartoonist. So uh, so if he if he can see how, you know, if, if he's cool, if he's cool with my shit, man, then that's all that matters to me. <laughs> yeah. It can be very difficult as a creator nowadays because you do have to kind of expect criticism and anticipate it and deal with it. And, you know, just being able to say that you reached out to voices that are not necessarily represented as well, you know, and, and knowing your, your audience is, is basically the descendants of these people. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a very genuine approach to it. Yeah. And, and then there's also this 
a whole another level to this whole thing, which is the current Mexican culture itself is not homogenous. There's some, most of Mexico is what they call mestizo, which yeah. is a combination of these Spaniards who came and the locals. Mm -hmm. So, so they themselves, you know, are in a constant flux and self-examination about their national identity. I mean, that's going on all the time. In fact, actually, the there's this uh, there's this phrase in Mexico that's bandied about as an insult to people called Malinchism, Malinchism, which is uh, meaning uh, someone a Mexican who is more interested in cultures outside of his own. Uh -huh. So, for instance, like from our perspective, that would be like uh, you know like me being super interested in manga. Mm -hmm. That's the exclusion of maybe it's like American. my friends in Phoenix that were Mexican that were really into Morrissey, you know. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, so, so that's that's called Malinchism, and uh, and then you're a Malinchista or a Malinch, you know, whatever. And um, that comes from uh, the name of this girl who was Cortez's translator, who is a um, a Mexican, who they stumble. This is one, one of the many insane coincidences of the story. Cortez shows up. He has no translator. He has a person with him who can sort of speak, um, who can sort of speak Mayan, and he stumbles across this girl who is given to him as part of a tribute after he won a combat. You know, they give him bread and turkeys and some women for his dude for his men to sleep with, mm -hmm. and uh, to rape. And um, so she shows up as a tribute, and it turns out that she can speak. Mayan, as well as the uh, language of the Mexica, Nahuatl, Nahuatl. So, so all of a sudden he has this translator, and now he can actually get his business done. Without a translator, he could have never gotten anything done. So now he has this has this person who can help him out. She was eighteen years old, probably younger, probably sixteen for our comic book purposes. I, I'm making her eighteen just to <laughs> keep that clean. And uh, so her name was uh, Malinali, uh, which then later was corrupted by the Spaniards into Malinche. And she is this amazing figure because she's the linchpin for the whole story. Without without this teenage girl, none of this would have ever happened. And she's this insanely problematic figure for Mexican history because she's at the bo at, at the same time the mother of the modern Mexico mm -hmm. and the great betrayer. So it's it's she's like two halves of this coin. So depending on who you side with, she's 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 the hero or the villain. I, I've never heard of women being treated like that before. <laughs> <laughs> From the dawn of time. So, so you know, so there's all these complicated cultural things going on in Mexico, and, and there's no way that anybody will ever navigate it correctly. Yeah. So all I have to just do is just make sure that, you know, that I've just done my homework. That's all anyone can, can hope for. Portray it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, yeah. and, just, and just be really conscious about the perspective. So, like, for instance, in any given scene when I'm doing this, when I'm laying out the page, do I have it from, you know, over the shoulder of one side or the other? And and who speaks first? And like, you know, like, the you know, like so I, I'm constantly thinking about other ways of telling the story because the most of what we have for the story comes from the account of memoir of one of the soldiers, one of the conquistadors. Mm -hmm. um, the Aztec account came after the fact, came after the conquest when a friar, a Spanish friar, who is a genuinely interested anthropologist who wanted to learn about the culture? Dos Passos. Uh, no, it was uh, it was um, not Las Casas. It was uh, oh Jesus Christ! I'm spacing his name now. Okay. Uh, um, I uh, yeah. uh, so he, so <laughs> see, he wrote this thing called the Florentine Codex, and in it is uh, uh is these volumes about the culture, but then the last volume is about the events of the of the conquest. But it was written after the fact. And it was commissioned by a Spaniard who had some editorial control over it. So it's not 100% reliable, but it's the only voice that we have from the indigenous side. So, uh, so the, uh, so, but there's not enough detail in that. The detail comes from the Spanish account. Yeah. So what I do is I take the Spanish account, and then I, I compare it with the native account. And I try and tell the details that were presented in the Spanish account from the Mexican perspective. So say for instance, there's a parlay between the between the two sides and there and and the Spanish account will talk in detail about how and then they brought this table over and then the, then the, then these guys stood over here and then this went around and and they'll give all that kind of the dynamic of the scene. So I will take that information which of which the Spaniard has no reason to lie. Why would he lie about the, 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 the table was moved after they yeah. had dinner and you know like that, that kind of stuff is there's no bias there. That's yeah. just logistics. 
but then I'll tell that scene from the native perspective. So, so I'll have the, it's from the natives going, you know, so saying something like, oh, why are they taking the table away? You know, like, so, so it'll be from their side of it. Yeah. And then, and then I just can't help it to throw in as much iconoclastic little moments as possible. For instance, when Cortez shows up on the beach for the first time, he, he was, you would sometimes, Captain would sometimes give the honor of planting the flag to one of his, you know, to one of his favorite subordinates, but Cortez had this ego. So he was going to, he gets off the boat first and plants the flag first and makes the declaration, you know, I mm -hmm. claim this land in the, in the name of Mars. Isn't that nice? Yeah. And uh, in the panel, I made sure to have in the same panel, you can see off to the right, a bunch of Indians standing there, you know, like checking them out. Yeah. Like, what are you thing? crazy what's, white what's, people what's doing? You know, but... Uh, if if they were telling it from the Spaniard's point of view, I would cut yeah. that off. I would just have the great moment, the upshot of Cortez and his flag and everything. But I wanted this I wanted to, like, yeah. to remind people: no, people were here first. There's a mm -hmm. bunch of people standing there just checking them out, going, "What? What the?" the hell? <laughs> and in fact, I, I, uh, it was before Cortez. There had been a previous expedition that was just a scouting expedition, just to get the lay of the land before Cortez showed up, and they had with them um, a musician. Uh, like you know, their entertainment center, a guy who would tell jokes, do dances, and play a little song for the for the crew, because they didn't have iPods. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the bard. Right. So <laughs> no, uh, the party bard. So so in this so in this scene where Cortez lands, the word balloons coming out of the Indians in the distance. Hey, hey, remember that? Uh, hey, remember that musician they brought that these these kinds of people brought last year? And the other guy goes, Yeah, he was funny. So I get to. <laughs> I get the undercut, you know, they undercut this, the, the, the great drama of Cortez playing this flag in the background going, hey, I wonder if they brought that funny musician with them. <laughs> yeah, I, think the guy, I guess the guy's name was Bernardino de Sahagun. That's very good. Look and, at that. Yeah. And uh, original title, uh, La Historia Universal de las Cosas de Nueva España. Yes. Sagan was, the, was <laughs> it's considered in history to be the first anthropologist, period. He was the first guy to ever... To, to study another culture with seriousness, with you know, and try and understand them. Now, underneath, interesting motivation. Underneath all of that was his Catholic thing about conversion. Mm -hmm. But he had this idea, which seems kind of unusual at the time, that the best way to convert them is to first understand them, and then it'll be easier to because then you'll be able Follow to take the Romans. You'll yeah. take their. You'll be able to take their perspective and and shape yours to you know shape theirs to yours. And so in doing that, he inadvertently produced this invaluable historical work of this culture that we would have otherwise not had. So it was, so it was one of the few times where like religious fanaticism paid off. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It was, sounds like early POA. <laughs> <laughs> For God. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of feel very conflicted about a lot of this stuff because, you know, as a Hispanic person, like I'm very used to representation in media for me being, you know, some, some barato being like, Hey man, how's it going? You know? Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, on the, on the new flash TV show, uh, there's a scientist named Cisco Ramon, uh, who basically looks like me. And it wasn't something I ever really thought about before, but having a guy who looks like me, oh, yeah. who's a super smart scientist. Dr. Wells will be monitoring your energy output and Caitlin, your vitals. What do you do? I make the toys, man. Who, you know, just talks without an accent was, was like really this emotional experience for me that I, I didn't expect going into it. And Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 it's so hard. It's so endearing to see that kind of stuff when you see posts on social media. Like, you know, this uh, this little black girl playing Leslie Jones from Ghostbusters. She, she now has, you know, a, a big blockbuster movie superhero that she can cosplay. Yeah. yeah, well, and I mean, you know, it's just to me, there's a just giving a shit, you know, really helps a lot. I mean, yeah, actually <laughs> caring. Yeah, and and I, I mean, to a certain extent, it's also, you know, there there's there there's representation which I'm fine with, and you know, it would be weird in a historical story to have a you know black viking but i mean you know with thor where it's largely mytho mythological like i don't care like i mean these are fantastic supernatural figures like i don't know why they yeah. would follow the same you know characteristics and, and well there probably was black viking because i mean I, i've seen there's this twitter feed that i'm following called medieval poc and then and the person posts nothing but old engravings paintings you know all this stuff of people of color in like going all the way back to the dawn of time mm. oh yeah, yeah in ways in ways that you would have like oh Wow, you know, like because because all of our movie and TV representations 
uh, just didn't have that up until recently. I mean, like it was it was actually striking for me, being a fan of like the big budget like war epics, to see in the new Wonder Woman film when they had the obligatory dockyard or train station scene where you see all the troops, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at the troops, and in almost every single shot, there's a person of color or or or, or, the, or the Indian uh, contingents the, mm -hmm. with the turbans. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, and so so I was like, well, look at all those turbans in this train station. It's like I, I just it just really reminded me and hopefully others about how that wasn't shown just mm. even just just this, you know ten years ago. And it was like it was, yeah it's like this was a, this was a working empire that you know imperial subjects were kind of mm -hmm. like you know ported you know ported around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like 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 uh, I really enjoyed this moment in the um, in the last season of Doctor Who episode two where they have uh, there uh, there's a creature in the Thames River. And uh, and so his his companion steps out of the TARDIS, and she immediately notices all these people of color in London, eighteen forty, whatever it was, and, and she's sort of thrown by it. Interesting. What is? Regency England. A bit more black than they show in the movies. And you know, because and he explains to her, well, you know, that's because you know TV or movies don't show that. Yeah. Yeah. So is Jesus. It's just a whitewash. Well, and, you know, the thing with the the whole Aztec thing is that, you know, most of the representations of Aztecs I've seen, it's 100% about blood sacrifice. Yeah. And, like, I know that they were pretty into that, but I assume that they had other things going right. on. They, they, and, I mean, like, the Vikings practiced human sacrifice. The yeah. Romans, it wasn't actually, common, but they actually... Early, yeah, mm -hmm. civilizations I mean, the, did. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. the Romans would absolutely kill people if they felt it was necessary. Um, sure. And, they, they, you know, they they thought it was kind of, you know in poor taste they thought it was you know uncouth but like it still happened and i mean you know the it, it was not uncommon for uh chinese slaves to get buried with people so i mean you know it, it but people have this tendency to latch on to like one aspect of a culture and just that's the whole thing for them that's a salient example right yeah. and in, in fact and and and, the, and as soon as because i see a lot of this and uh because there's you know recent rise of of right-wing bullshit on social media and Twitter, and so the what every every once in a while when I uh, do a search on Twitter just just to see what's out there of Aztecs or Aztecs Aztec or Aztecs, uh, the results come back and it's it, they're an amazing whipping boy for hatred of Mexico because everybody any right wing black will immediately use Aztecs go right there and say well. You know, the Essex were brutal, bloodthirsty savages. So that's why Mexico's fucked up like that, because that's their, that's their, you know, that's their whatever yeah. genotype. Yeah. yeah, they're violent. They have the warrior gene. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Something like that. And, and but it's like, it, that's the very first thing everybody goes to constantly is, is, is the sacrifice. And, and yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. They did the heart sacrifice thing. They, uh, they sacrifice kids. They even did ritual things where part of the body was used in a ritual way uh, and they ate, and they ate it. Mm -hmm. you know, like, but but I mean, it wasn't like their meal. It was more like a, like a Eucharist kind of thing. You know, here's the body of this of this person who's been sacrificed, who now has been imbued with these supernatural powers, and this is how you get a little bit of that power into yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there's a there's a human sacrifice in the Old Testament uh, in Judges. There you go. You know, and I I wouldn't be entirely shocked if that didn't happen more often, and that it's just been stripped from those records. Yeah, there's there, yeah there's there's an attempted human sacrifice even in Genesis. So yeah, those yeah. Yeah, well, if well, that was that was that was just pranks, bro. <laughs> yeah, he was just he was just messing with him. Even if it wasn't ritualized or codified in the culture, there you know, the history of violence that we 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 tend to whitewash the narratives very often when they speak to our you know whatever aim we're trying to get at and it's ridiculous because you know all cultures all history have that as some component of it and and you know if if, I mean, if you want to like cut heads and like try you know compare or do what about um we will always lose you know the united states because our yeah. nation was built on two things slavery and genocide mm -hmm. and and so it's 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 the equivalent of like somebody you know whatever 500 years from now doing some graphic novel about the united states and everybody just goes immediately to you know the native american genocide and, and and as rightly they should but you know there's you know we did a couple of other things i didn't necessarily make up for it but you know there's, yeah. there's other there was other aspects yeah i think i think the the uh, the ledger is definitely just entirely red oh and, no yeah. completely I, history is written in blood i mean it's nothing but that and actually this is a big challenge for this for this series i'm working on because one of the reasons that it's never been depicted visually is because it's really fucking rough. 
Mm -hmm. It's really dark. Yeah, massacres the... and and rape and murder and just just horrific stuff going down. And so I, I it's just intimidating as hell to undertake this subject. And I deliberately approached it uh, by choosing an artist who I'm a, who I'm a big fan of, who I've known for years, a good friend of mine, who helped found Helioscope Studio with me, David Hahn. And his style has this kind of like, you know, Batman the Animated Series kind of vibe to yeah. it. And that works on so many levels for this project because one, just the open line kind of coloring book quality is echoes the Mexican Codex, you know, that kind of open line coloring book style. And his work, when even when he does graphic stuff, like he did a thing which Howard Chicken wrote called Bite Club for Vertigo, even when it gets really rough and bloody, his his work is so stylized. It has this like Jaime Hernandez kind of idyllic quality that that even gore is not off putting. It's kind of has this kind of elegance. Abstract and Yeah. Yeah. And so and so so to so he and then plus the way I'm coloring it, I'm doing the he, uh, so I do the layouts, the script and the layouts, uh so that I can have it everything, you know, flow the way it should. He does the pencils and inks and then I go back and do like some little corrections to make it historically accurate. Maybe that necklace wasn't exactly right or something like that. And then I'll color it. And uh my coloring approach is an animated kind of style. It's all only cuts. Uh, I don't want to do any blends and only three tiers, you know, the light middle mm -hmm. the, and that's it. And, and so as you read this thing, there'll be a lot of rough stuff, but it will have this elegance and a, like a visual poetry that'll keep you from completely uh, sensationalize it, mm. which is the right. the thing that we've and, and like, like, like calling back to earlier when we were talking about like the blood spurts in Lone Wolf and Cub. Arterial spray, yeah. Right, right. In real life, that doesn't exist. I've seen like footage from movies, like for instance, Apocalypse Now, they have a sequence where they sacrifice a, a, a bull. I've seen it, unfortunately, I've seen a couple things on YouTube. When somebody gets hit with, their, when a piece of flesh gets hit with a, with an edge weapon, there is no blood spurt. The, the, oh, muscles, the, the muscles are shocked immediately and they clench. They constrict, yeah. And, and, and what happens is, is it's a pretty clean thing and then it takes a second and it just seeps out. It doesn't, no. there's no. Now stand aside, worthy adversary. Tis but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off. No, it isn't. Well, what's that then? Python. Yeah, see, it's, it's not like Monty Python's and right. the Holy Grail and what, right. what the hell film was, it was, there was like that other film like a year before, um, I can't remember what the hell, where it was like very obviously, it was like so gory, like gory knights in army or armor battling that it was like, okay, those guys obviously saw that, this film, <laughs> like, said, and just like, we're, you know, the, we're ripping 11. this off. Yeah. Right. Right. Monty Python and the Holy Grail is also very culturally insensitive. I think there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of stereotypes. There. Now, we, yeah, no, yeah. The, well, they did, sh they did show the violence inherent in the system. Help! Help! I'm being repressed. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's just the coconut knockers as a slur is, I think, you know, just <laughs> not appropriate. To be continued on the next exciting episode of giving the mic to the wrong person. Check us out at facebook.com slash giving the mic.